like to welcome everyone today to the latest presentation in our Natural Areas Management Services webinar series, a case study brought to you by the Woods Near Backyard Partnership. That's a cooperative effort of the University of Maryland Extension, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Penn State Extension, the Virginia Department of Forestry, and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service. Funding for this webinar series was made possible in part by a grant from the Harry R. Hughes Center for Agroecology. This is the third and final webinar in our series. We started two weeks ago on March 10th, talking about developing a woods in your backyard land care plan for clientele. We followed that up last week with improving tree health and managing deer problems. And we'll be ending up the series today, converting lawn to natural area and controlling invasive plants, also through a case study approach. Now, today's webinar covers two additional high priority land care practices for the case study property based on the interests of the property owners and the results of the checklist and as described in the land care plan. The first will cover how to convert unused lawn area into a haven for wildlife by converting it to woods and meadows. Now planting trees and shrubs and forbs and grasses is only the first step. Practices such as controlling competing and invasive vegetation and maintaining tree protection will help ensure success. Next, we'll examine the invasive plant problems on the case study property and how best to control them, including a detailed examination of herbicide selection and application methods. But before we get started with all of that, we've got a little bit of housekeeping if you've been with us for the last two weeks. Welcome back. And if you're new to us, thank you for joining us. I'm Andrew Kling with the University of Maryland Extension Woodland Stewardship Education Program. My co-host is Agnes Kedmanez, behind the scenes, also from the University of Maryland. And again, thank you for registering. We've had a couple of hiccups with the continuing education credits and their certificates, but we think we've got it all straightened out now. So if you have any problems, please reach out to the state where you registered and we can facilitate that. And we'll be sending out the certificates and then you can forward them to the association of your choice. And this is old hat for those of you who've been on Zoom before, and that includes a lot of us, but it, just a quick reminder, the Q&A button, the Q&A button is for questions and answers only, and the chat room is for chatting only. And there is a difference, uh, questions for the presenters, and we'll keep a hold of those and we'll cover them during the last half hour from 3.30 to 4.00. And we have other members from the Woods New Backyard Partnership joining us today, and they'll be in the chat room listening to what's going on, and they can answer uh, concerns and questions and add to the participation, like uh, including links that people might find interesting and things of that nature. Now, there are actually going to be two evaluations associated with the webinar today. One is the one right at the end. We, invite you to stay on until the very end. And when you close your browser screen, you'll be taken to a quick evaluation just for today. That's just an evaluation on, on today's webinar. And then we'll send out another webinar in the next week or so. Then we'll ask you to evaluate the entire series. And please take some time to give us feedback on both of these. It really does help us figure out what you folks want from our webinar series or workshops or face-to-face -face presentations, whatever you want to see from us and the partnership going forward. Now we've got two presenters today. We've got Ryan Davis from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay and Dave Jackson from Penn State. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about both of them. Now, Ryan Davis manages the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay's forest program out of their Pennsylvania office in Lancaster. He holds a BS in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology and a minor in forestry from North Carolina State University, and an MS in wildlife and fisheries biology from West Virginia University. He spent the first half of his career in the field, as he puts it, traveling the country to chase critters, and the latter half creating habitat in Pennsylvania. Ryan now specializes in education and outreach on stewardship, helping landowners meet their habitat management goals on working lands, and reforestation of agricultural and developed land. Now, Dave Jackson is currently employed by Penn State Extension as a regional forest resources educator. He's been with Penn State since January of 2002. 
He earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry and completed a Master of Forest Resources at the Penn State University. Dave has worked in various positions with the U.S. Forest Service, Forest Industry, State Forestry, and Private Forestry Consulting before coming to Penn State. Now, Ryan, I believe you're going first today. Are you about ready to go? I am. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn off my video. Yep, Ryan Davis with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. I'm here to talk about converting lawns to natural areas. Um, uh, some of this might be kind of, you know, review for a lot of y'all, but, um, you know, I hope that I can kind of give some sort of tips and tricks that, that may help you along the way, um, uh, kind of, you know, making all my experience worth it. Uh, very quickly about my organization, you know, potentially to help provide a little bit of context. Uh, so we are all about restoring the Chesapeake Bay, um, but we kind of more focus on restoring the watershed. Um, we restore the watershed, we're going to improve the bay itself, but then obviously we're going to, you know, um, improve uh, the watershed, <laughs> all of the local streams that, um, uh, and, and communities that, that feed into it. Um, we really uh, function with partners um, exclusively. We, we kind of can't do anything on our own. We're a pretty small organization. Um, so this Woods in Your Backyard is a very, you know, good example of how we do that. Um, we're all about kind of bringing people together and getting stuff done. Um, we have four program areas. Um, agriculture and forests are the biggest things up here in PA. Um, uh, and then we do a lot of green infrastructure work in other areas. And I, I also wanted to mention that because there might be possibility uh, for some of y'all to work with our teams out of the DC office, potentially the Annapolis office, um, and then the Richmond office where we're doing a lot more green infrastructure work um, than up here in PA where most of our work is even in green infrastructure in kind of a residential context is, is kind of through my program. So that it's more of reforestation than green infrastructure. Um, and then I really always like to mention this stewardship and engagement category, uh, maybe just kind of my personal drum I'm beating. Uh, but um, I think that the reason why we're still so far behind on conservation is because for the most of the time we've been doing it, we, we kind of focus on getting restoration work done and not on connecting the communities to the restoration work that we're doing. Um, and, you know, non-point source pollution is death by a million cuts. And so, you know, um, until we start to kind of suture those uh, wounds and connect people to um, understanding how to act in the landscape um, uh, in a way that would be less um, uh, damaging to that landscape, then, then finally we'll be able to kind of make some progress. Um, okay, so what do I do? Um, I have some pretty simple goals. I'm trying to increase the quantity of forest cover in the Bay watershed. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, reforestation, afforestation, um, increase the quality of forest cover too. So forest management, um, which Dave's going to cover today. Uh, we do a lot of forest management work um, kind of more in central PA, north, northern tier of PA, where there's kind of more forest cover to manage. Um, uh, and then again, that stewardship connecting folks. Um, so here's one of our riparian forest buffer sites uh, planted in, um, I think that was 20, yeah, it was 2020. It was, it was during the COVID shutdown. Um, so that's why I brought my dog instead of having, you know, volunteers to help. Um, I do like to include her picture. You may hear her howling at some point. Um, so I'm sorry in advance if you do. Um, okay, let's get on into it. So um, I'm not going to belabor this because, you know, y'all are practitioners. You, you know all this stuff already. Um, but while you're talking to landowners, it may be valuable for you to have some persuasive tools in your belt, if you will, um, sort of, to sort of explain why this is important beyond some of the things that the landowners kind of might already know. Um, I think one of the big things that drives a lot of people is, is biodiversity, um, especially uh, adding pollinators back to the landscape, pollinator habitat. We're going to kind of really go in detail there. One thing that I kind of want everyone to walk away with is the knowledge that forests are also fantastic for pollinators. Um, you don't just have to have a sea of herbaceous vegetation to be accommodating pollinators. Um, but something that people may not really be thinking about is, is water quality. Um, the, the dramatic benefits of reducing lawn cover. Um, lawn cover can infiltrate about one inch of rainwater in an hour, uh, whereas a forest can infiltrate about 16 inches. Um, and, you know, our entire landscape uh, was, was historically forested. So our stream systems, our, our hydrology is, is basically used to a context where, you know, the entire landscape was infiltrating 16 inches of rainwater an hour, and now we have a lot of impervious surface and then lawns all over the place too. Um, here in Pennsylvania, it's almost 7% of the entire state 
his lawn cover, uh, which is you know pretty offensive to me as an ecologist. Um, but uh, the reality is we need to be thinking about that. That is a vast amount of the landscape that is not infiltrating that much uh, rainwater. It's turning into runoff. If we have more and more and more runoff and less and less and less infiltration, we may be getting into a situation where we are having water quantity issues in addition to water quality issues here in the east. So just throwing that out there for everyone to chew on. Um, obviously, chemical inputs, you know, with a, a kind of traditionally managed lawn um, where there's a lot of um, broadleaf herbicides, fertilizers, um, and then, you know, our favorite petrochemical, right? Gas, gasoline to do all that mowing. Um, uh, this uh, maybe is something that's going to motivate a lot of people um, as prices are, are climbing here. Um, and then kind of less on the environmental benefits, more on the kind of personal benefits uh, to a landowner, saving a lot of time and money. You know, upfront costs here are higher, but it's an investment. It is an investment in both time and money um, and honestly, you know, enjoyment. Um, uh, if you kind of look over a 10 year scale, um, you're going to be paying a lot less, you know, per acre. Uh, to manage, you know, a meadow, say, or a forest, um, then, you know, then just mowing, if you're really concentrating on how much am I going to spend year one, uh, just having someone mow a lawn, you know, have some high school and mow the lawn um, every week is going to be cheaper, but over time, it is going to save a substantial amount of money and time. Um, uh, and then um, it depends on a lot of factors, but the data shows consistently that forest canopy um, around on a property is going to um, dramatically increase the property value. Um, a lot of landowners also want reforestation in a residential context for privacy, which I you know, completely understand. Um, uh, and then additionally, I think increasingly there's more um, uh, appetite for this kind of work. There's more appetite to see you know, native vegetation rather than lawns. Um, and so there is certainly um, a lot of landowners that um, this is way more appealing to um, not only to have on their property, but to actually sell the property. And I, I hope that's the case because I've done uh, a lot of this work at my own place and someday we'll sell it and, you know, we'll see if people uh, like it <laughs> at that point. Um, so real quick, a couple more of these kind of, you know, sort of persuasive things to, to discuss with, with uh, homeowners or landowners who are maybe on the fence. Um, what do we mean about this kind of biodiversity issue? Um, I think it's a way bigger issue than people are thinking. Um, I honestly, it kind of is, is very um, similar threat level, in my opinion, um, as climate change is. Um, having a complete loss of ecosystem function because we're losing our, our vegetative diversity. Um, basic principle of ecology, the more plant species you have, the more animal species, native animal species you can accommodate. Um, if we don't have much native plant tissue on the landscape, we're not going to have very much native animal tissue on the landscape. Um, our entire ecosystems are starting to kind of dissolve in front of our eyes. We have seen global declines of insects, uh, especially aerial insects. Um, and that's, yeah, again, all over the place. It's in rainforests, it's in agricultural settings, it's in mixed settings, it's everywhere. Um, and I think we've all noticed this, the kind of, you know, um, famous standard is the, the windshield test, um, where you kind of, if you drive at night in the summertime, um, you're not going to have much bugs on your windshield or or your the grill of your car. Whereas if we think 30 years ago, and I'm 32, but like, I remember when I was young, my mom's Dodge Neon being, you know, completely full of of gross, you know, uh, <laughs> smushed insects every time we would go drive somewhere at night. Um, so we're seeing this with our very eyes uh, qualitatively. Um, I have noticed the woods are a lot quieter than they used to be um, everywhere. Um, and so you know, something that we we do need to think about. Uh, I, and again, I think as long as, as far as threat levels to me, this really kind of goes toe to toe um, with climate change because we need functioning ecosystems if we are to have ecosystem services like clean water and clean air. Um, so if people care about this, then you know we have a really easy way to start low hanging fruit. Um, we don't have to try to convert agricultural fields to habitat per se, we can focus on the areas that aren't really doing that much otherwise, um, like the lawn. And so to kind of really just one more final point in this about the landscape and the, the floral diversity, um, here's an aerial of our region. Sorry, we're not too into Virginia, sorry, but hey, you know, you know it, how it is, it's the same. It's the same, all that light green, all that ag and, and cities, um, this is not really providing much uh, functioning ecosystems. They're really only in the green spots. And as we all know, 
those areas are getting increasingly um, a low quality uh, in, in their value as ecosystems because of invasive plants, um, overabundance of deer, and so on. So um, it really is a crisis on the landscape, and, and people can help by easily attacking you know, the area that is, is not really doing much right now. Um, so what I kind of, you know, my, one of my catchphrases, are you using your lawn for something? We're usually using their lawn for something for sure, but the whole lawn, the whole lawn. So um, there are good reasons to have a lawn. Of course, we all know the reasons why to have, you know, it's good to play Frisbee. It's good to have a little bit of visibility. Good to have, um, you know, quick stability of an area that you're kind of having a lot of foot traffic over, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But a vast majority of areas that are lawn are kind of only touched by a mower. Um, and so again, low hanging fruit, if, if folks care, uh, about the landscape, if folks care about our ecosystems, then we can easily convert these to actually functioning, thriving ecosystems. So what are all our alternatives uh, uh, to lawn cover? Um, well, just our native habitat types. And honestly, you know, these are, these are the same, it's, this is the same habitat, just different time scales, right? Um, the meadow is very, very early successional habitat. The forest is later successional habitat. Uh, because of where we are now with, again, those deer overabundances with invasive plants, we can't just really let an area go and turn into forest, go through this cycle on its own. Remember what I said about ecosystem services and a collapse of our ecosystems? If we can't proceed through succession, which is a very basic ecological principle, something is deeply wrong on our landscape. So okay, I'll just put that out there. Um, but uh, we can restore these um, and then manage them, uh, you know, depending on what the landowner's objectives are, um, depending on yeah what they want out of it, no matter what, you're going to have a massive amount of environmental benefit um, and personal benefit. So again, money saved, um, you know, all the habitat quality, water quality features, um, and something that I don't think we really talk about that much, we kind of focus on the stewardship um, and kind of convincing people to do things for the right reasons. But it's actually really fun. It's way more fun than a lawn. A lawn is boring. Um, you can't, what do you, yeah, I don't know, play some bocce ball or something out there. I don't know, have fun. But for me to be able to sit somewhere and watch, you know, um, swarms and swarms and swarms of insects foraging in the middle of the summer um, is, is way more fun uh, than just sitting in a lawn and, and baking in the sun. Um, so I wanted to start with reforestation because it's probably the thing that folks maybe have a little bit more experience with. I mean, most people have planted trees and shrubs. It's just a matter of doing it in a way that's kind of planned out so that you're planning for um, the maintenance that's gonna be required and you're planning for it to become a forest. So um, one of the big reasons why this is a good way to go is because this was the dominant uh, cover type historically. Um, our forests probably didn't look exactly like they do now because we kind of have a pretty homogenous situation for age classes. Um, and then even with our disturbance regimes, there was a lot of areas in the Bay watershed here in the, in the mid Atlantic that were getting burned somewhat frequently, um, fire through the landscape, creating a lot of openings. Um, and yeah, there, there were a lot of things were different, but uh, it was forest uh, um, in some way, shape or form. Um, and so again, forests are still great for pollinators and other insects. You go out into a state forest somewhere in the middle of nowhere, you know, no open area around, you're still going to have tons and tons and tons, of, you're going to have more insect diversity there um, than in an open landscape that's all agriculture with a little meadow planting, you know. Um, uh, forests are also more environmentally beneficial than, you know, the young forest of the meadow um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and then also a great thing about reforestation into a lawn situation is you have very minimal site prep. Uh, because all you have to do is scuff away the lawn right where you're going to plant. You plant it, and then pretty low maintenance after establishment, you mow the you mow the lawn. And we'll we'll kind of get into the the details there until uh, your trees get established. So uh, this is a, a pretty kind of quick, easy way to go. Um, if this is the way you are going, a couple of sort of you know considerations to make, food for thought. Um, one of the best things you could possibly do is cram in as many species as possible. Um, and a lot of species are super palatable to a landowner. We usually try to get about 25, 30 species in to every single site. And that includes a lawn conversion um, planting. Um, and so uh, another thing I really like to remind folks is don't forget your shrubs. We are talking about a forest and we don't want to miss the forest for the trees, right? Uh, for it, trees are certainly a, a dominant feature of forests, but shrubs are incredibly valuable um, for habitat, for pollinators, 
um, for wildlife food. We can see there this ironwood viburnum um, providing some, some soft mass there. But um, if we think about the habitat, so here on the left, this is a, about an 11 year old um, crep planting actually. So this is a riparian forest buffer, but you can see it's in lawn cover. Um, there, it's all trees and there's no shelter still for wildlife, right? Um, if uh, if uh, uh, you know, a fox was trying to move through here, he would, it would be very susceptible to um, aerial predators potentially um, hanging out in these trees um, or other predators. And so there's, there's not a lot of cover. You need thick, dense shrubs um, to, to form cover. And then think too about the winter time here. It's going to be completely open to the elements um, and it's not really going to be very accommodating for habitat. So we want to make sure um, we're planting a lot of shrubs. Also, on that note, and I'm, you know, um, this landowner, I'm very glad they planted the riparian forest buffer, but um, they are continuing to mow. Um, even with not really anything growing uh, underneath the trees, they're continuing to mow. You know, the point of this is to establish habitat. So we want to, to mow as long as we need to mow to establish the trees. And then we want to kind of let it become good habitat. So uh, mowing is, is our double-edged sword. It's our management tool, um, something that we want to really slow down or and completely stop eventually. Um, and also, yeah, all these environmental factors of mowing, you know, you're, if you're mowing under the trees every week, that's, you're not really helping still. <laughs> you just have trees amongst the areas that you're mowing. Um, so uh, a lot of folks in kind of the landscaping world would plant really big stock. Um, if you're planting at large scale, um, it's going to take a little bit more work on the establishment end, on the sort of maintenance end at post planting, but I have way more success planting small stock, and it's going to be dramatically more affordable at a larger scale of planting, say, you know, we usually plant about 250, 275 trees per acre, trees and shrubs per acre. Um, and so that's, if those are five gallon pots, it would be a, a, a crazy job, but you can get a bundle of 25 bare root seedlings there um, for it's 75 cents a piece, um, a containerized tree there for, you know, $4, maybe 4.30 or so at this point. Um, uh, and, and you can move them around a lot easier. You can plant them a lot easier. Um, and they will catch up to the bigger trees and surpass them. I, in my experience, the smaller guys will catch up uh, fast. Um, but, you know, it certainly is an option to plant larger stuff. Um, but, you know, just to throw that out there, consider the small trees, they, you know, they are worth um, planting. We, we plant them, you know, more than we plant large stuff for a reason. Um, don't have to remind all that, you know, plant during the dormant season. Um, what you want to avoid when planting, when reforesting an entire area is needing to water anything so that you know dormant season is key and then you kind of don't have to worry about it obviously if it's a super dry year you know you might lose a lot of trees or you might just not get any growth and then you know you just replant that's kind of my main strategy for maintenance is if something doesn't work you replant um the only way we can fail is by not going back to the site and not you know working on fixing it up um okay and then obviously you know you know the, the root collar keeping it even with the soil um, in a landscape setting, a lot of folks will put it a little bit higher, but we're, you know, working on returning this to a forest. These trees are not going to be mulched. They're not going to be managed in the same way. So, you know, we try to keep that root collar even with the soil. Um, so I can't say it enough. Shelter, shelter, shelters. There's too many deer. Um, everyone's going to be disappointed if you plant trees and you don't shelter them. They're, they're going to get completely wiped out. Um, some folks will use deer fences, but they are um, prohibitively expensive for almost everyone. Um, so we use these tree shelters. Um, so uh, these tubes, you can use chicken wire, you can, you can, you know, fashion things out of other things. Um, but at scale, you know, we're planting about 10,000 uh, trees with just staff and volunteers. And then, you know, another probably um, 15,000 uh, via contractor um, up here in PA. And, you know, we're not going to make 10,000 chicken wire um, uh, cages. Um, and we're certainly not going to, you know, not use the shelters because we would have to replant everything and everything would likely die. Um, however, and, and another, you know, one downside uh, of these shelters is that they are expensive. They are more money than the tree to get the stake and the shelter, but it's, it's an investment. If you don't put the shelter on, you're not going to have a tree or a shrub, you know, into the future. So highly recommend it. Um, one thing I'm, I talked about kind of making sure you are planning for the long term. Um, a lot of landowners don't like a grid. Uh, they don't like the aesthetics. They, they want a forest. They want something natural. So they don't want to put this grid on the landscape. A couple things about that. First of all, once the trees get going, 
it's going to be kind of hard to tell it's a grid unless it's kind of like a perfect grid and you're standing at just the right angle. Um, and especially because we're mixing in understory species with canopy species, it doesn't really look like a, a plantation forever. It can, it, you know, if it's managed that way, um, but it, it often doesn't. Um, and then additionally, you can set things up in rows so that maintenance is a lot easier um, without doing a grid. So I don't know if this is kind of hard to tell. I think it's pretty clear that here is kind of the alley between rows of trees, but we have this structure the whole way around. And so, you know, standing at an angle, if you're not looking in that lane uh, to mow in between, it just looks like, you know, almost random, uh, random tree planting. And even when you can see the rows, they're on a contour, they're on a curve. The human eye loves curves. Um, and, you know, the, the grids kind of look artificial, but curves don't. So, you, you know, it's not mutually exclusive. You can plant in rows without planting necessarily in a grid. Preserve those aesthetics while making sure you can do maintenance. So on that note, maintenance, we also call it establishment care, um, depending on the, a couple factors, you know, what funding source you're using, you might need if you're going to be bringing in potentially grant funding or something, which there's a lot of programs out there I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, if you say you're doing tree establishment practices or tree establishment care, instead of maintenance, um, funders will fund that they oftentimes haven't caught up and won't fund maintenance, even though it's the exact same thing. And if we don't do this maintenance, we're not likely to keep our trees. Um, so the big things we're doing here is we are we are reducing the vegetative competition amongst the or you know between the trees and the grass, but we're also reducing the rodent cover for meadow voles um, in particular. Um, it, in my experience, in a lawn, you're still going to have some meadow voles. They're still going to cause some mortality. Um, it is oftentimes not as worth it to do this severe of maintenance where we are having someone, this is string trimmed here, uh, to do a ring of bare soil around each tree. Some folks will use herbicide, um, some folks will use a vegetation mat. Um, uh, this can be super valuable, but in a lawn, if you just kind of mow sort of close to the tree, yeah, you're going to lose some trees to vole damage, but I think it's kind of negligible considering the cost of doing the spraying. And then also with the spraying, and we're going to talk about the herbicide in a bit, but you know, y'all know the deal. Um, people have their preconceived notions about herbicide use, and you just don't even have to worry about it. Basically, you plant the trees into the lawn, you continue to mow the lawn a couple times, uh, maybe once a month during the growing season, that is really enough. Um, and then, you know, um, after a couple years, you can cease mowing entirely. Um, one note, if you're going to be doing string trimming, be very careful with these shelters you will slice these puppies up. I do it all the time, <laughs> all the time if I have to do kind of this, some emergency sort of winterizing of sites and that kind of thing in more kind of uh, naturalized areas rather than lawns. Um, so yeah, be careful there. Um, and then additionally, beyond the mowing of, of, of uh, or beyond the, the maintenance of mowing, potentially spraying, um, the individual tree care is super, super, super important. So the shelters are wonderful for keeping deer off and they're terrible for keeping the trees happy and healthy otherwise uh, because when they start to lean you know we get a little bit of thawing this time of year a lot of our shelters are leaning at an angle and a lot of landowners oh a couple of shelters fell over well yeah it's you know <laughs> the the ground was frozen and now it's not and so that's going to happen you know um but all you have to do is straighten them up repound those stakes in and, and the trees are happy even if like a big storm comes in and pushes a lot over if you get to them within a month, um, those trees are fine. You just have to straighten them up, repound them in. Additionally, we put a little uh, net on the top of the trees, um, of the tubes to, to prevent birds from going down inside. Um, you just pull that off once the, the tree is getting close to the top of the shelter um, so that the tree doesn't get tangled up in it. Um, things like that. Sometimes it's good to hand weed within there if, if necessary. Um, and then one of the biggest things is replanting. The mortality every year. Um, if you do that the first three years, you're not going to really have much else die. Um, you know, the first couple of years of establishment are really the critical period. Since we're putting them in shelters, really the only thing that kills them um, is, you know, is, is voles. Um, sometimes a little bit of, you know, drought or if the if they kind of really push out um, with the, the frost thaw cycle. Um, but if we're keeping up with that mortality every year, you're going to have less and less to replant every year. And eventually, within a couple of years, you're going to get to the point where just one or two trees might have died, um, and you can go ahead and just kind of uh, count it as established. Um, so this was on an agricultural site, not not exclusively a lawn, but still a really good demonstration. 
um, when it will these two pictures I'm about to show here. So if you do that good maintenance, you keep up with it um, 10 years in, this is what you get. Um, trees that are bigger than you would expect um, and, and looking great. Uh, if you don't do that maintenance, these little metavoles will, um, will kind of do a hurting. Now they really prefer different types of grasses than a lot of our kind of lawn grasses that are super thatched at the surface. Um, actually reed canary grass, our wonderful invasive plant uh, from Eurasia is perfect meadow vole habitat. They really like how all the dead material falls over. They have all the cover in the world. They are nice and safe and sound from predators and they will kill every single tree that gets planted into this. So um, if you are doing any reforestation in any naturalized area where it's not lawn grass, it is even more critical to be doing this uh, maintenance. And I would recommend doing those herbicide rings or something um, in those conditions. Um, but here's a great lawn site and you can see what this kind of looks like. It doesn't have to be anything super manicured. We're still getting really good tree survival. This is only year three and a lot, obviously we have a lot of real fast growing species here. Got uh, Prunus serotina, black cherry, we got sycamore. Um, I, I, I'm sure we've got tulip poplar in here. Um, and that's, you know, another consideration to make. I really recommend planting a lot of pioneer species because we're planting out in the open where pioneer species are kind of adapted to. Um, uh, but then by about year seven or so, this is a picture of a seven-year-old buffer. Um, the canopy starts to close, shades the understory, and now we're kind of done. The only maintenance that needs to happen is removing the, the final tree shelters once you're kind of ready to. Um, and I don't know if I really have a slide about that, but basically you're, you're I don't have a great recommendation. You're kind of trying to balance um, buck rub versus tree health. So this tree here is probably a little tight in that shelter. There might be some fungus growing in here. We might be getting a little bit of abrasion issues, but you take that off, a buck comes by, it might wipe out a decent amount of the trees. That's another reason why I like to replant so heavily so that after that year, you know, four or five, when we're kind of completely done with all the tending, we can just go ahead and take the shelters off. And if the deer wipe out 20%, well, we, we had 80% tree survival and that's pretty dang good. Um, so this is kind of where we want to get. And then this is the point you can see this landowner is not mowing uh, underneath here. Um, so I, I did already address this. I get this question a lot. Um, and so you, you probably will from landowners and a lot of landowners try to do this themselves where they just, oh, I want it to be woods. I learned in seventh grade that you let something go and it turns into woods. So I'm just gonna not mow anymore. Um, and it's not gonna turn into woods. If you do get woody species, um, you, it's gonna be all Bradford pear. Like we're starting to see blooming now. Isn't it the best time of year when I see Bradford pear everywhere, um, unfortunately. Um, uh, so yeah. 50 years ago, you could have done this, I think, maybe, um, maybe not even in, in like our lawn grasses that we have now, some of these thatchy guys, because they just, there's not a lot of space for trees to come up. Um, but uh, between the deer and the invasive plants, this is a pretty bad idea now. So again, the, the sort of fundamental ecological principle of succession is kind of broken down. Um, so we need to get in there and be the squirrels, you know, replanting the trees um, ourselves, kind of skipping ahead uh, to the forest. Um, if there is a stream on this property, even if it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little creek, we need to be pitching a riparian forest buffer. Um, a lot of landowners will want herbaceous cover. They're envisioning in their mind this meadow that they want. That's all wildflowers and stuff. And don't worry, we're going to talk a lot about that in a little bit. But um, if, if there is a stream running through that area, they really should have, for environmental means, they should really have trees around it. Um, herbaceous cover, even native, awesome native herbaceous plants are not going to do as good of a job at stabilizing the stream bank. They're not going to be feeding the biota in the stream in the same way that trees would. They're not going to be shading the water in the same way that trees would. They're just not going to be performing in the way that the streams have evolved. You know, as soon as the glaciers retreated, we had forests around these streams, and then we had forests around these streams until only, you know, uh, 200 years ago. Um, so uh, we, if you have a stream, you have a wetland, you know, very, very, very important um, to consider uh, planting a forest rather than just sticking with your herbaceous stuff. Um, so where do you buy them? Um, obviously, you know, you want to avoid the big box stores at conventional nurseries because they are going to sell you weird stuff that's not native, um, uh, not native stock. Um, I, I don't think I need to belabor this with this audience, but I just... I just do, I spend 10 minutes doing a little bit of research. Um, if I'm in a new area trying to find the native plant nurseries, reading everybody's website, 
a lot of people don't, they're small operations. You can call them, you can talk to them, you can see about discounts, you can see about stock, you can see about everything. So I, I recommend doing it that way. Um, and uh, if you get questions of, you know, I want to do the replanting myself or whatever from the landowner, um, this is maybe good advice to pass along to them too, to, to do this or to just buy from their, you know, their local conservation district seedling sale in the spring. Uh, you know, support a good cause and then also, uh, you know, get those trees, make sure they're native. Um, and I'm going to talk about this, the meadow seeding, uh, you know, where to buy seed in a little bit too. So I'll skip that for now. Um, okay, so big picture is, um, yes, a lot of residents are interested in this um uh for all the reasons we talked about um but we also have really 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 big goals is a little bit more urgent than just kind of well landowner sort of wants this thing and so so we'll go ahead and do it um we're kind of under the gun in the bay watershed to to be kind of performing better with our restoration work um or else the epa can do whatever they want to us <laughs> so um in pennsylvania uh we have these massive goals and this is why we're with if there's riparian habitat streamside habitat it's got to be for us because we have the goal of 86,000 new acres of, of new riparian forest buffer um by 2025 so that's eight planting seasons away seven if you don't count this one that we're kind of in right now um and then in the lawn perspective which we're kind of more talking about here today converting a lawn to a forest, we actually have a goal of 5,000 acres of lawn converted to a forest by 2025. Um, and so we also, the goal for meadow is also 5,000 acres. Um, so that's 10,000 acres total. And that is 1% of the lawn cover in the Bay Watershed of PA because there's a million acres of lawn in the Bay Watershed of PA. Uh, again, disturbing as an ecologist. Um, okay, so because, but the reason I'm talking about this is because there is funding available. There is public funding. There are programs all over the place um, to help landowners do this. And so as a practitioner, you could really get a lot of work done uh, because the landowners don't have to self-fund. Um, they're probably more willing to, to, to sign up to, to do this work. So um, if you kind of aren't familiar with the landscape of funds available, you can check with your municipality, conservation district, et cetera, um, about the options that are out there. Um, okay, so the meadow which is again, probably a little bit more sort of specific um, knowledge um, uh, than reforestation. Um, we don't have much uh, grassland habitat on our landscape anymore. Um, it is super valuable for a lot of species. There's a lot of species that only use um, this kind of habitat. Um, and so we, we really should have more on the landscape as part of our, our quest for more vegetative diversity. Um, and although forests do have kind of more environmental benefits than, than herbaceous, solely herbaceous plantings, um, they have a lot of benefits themselves. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about the, the ecology of these, these plant communities because it's really valuable in figuring out how to establish them. Um, but it also, again, kind of on that sort of persuasive level to sort of dial things back and think about how things were um, before European occupation of this continent. Um, so permanent European occupation of this continent. So um, we had grasslands everywhere, you know, uh, uh, prior to European occupation. Most of them were in the Midwest um, where uh, there's not a massive amount of rain. Um, and there's also um, a lot of fire burning all the time. Um, and there's also very large herbivores, uh, specifically, you know, bison. Um, and uh, but out here in the east, we kind of had similar situations. Um, it was less about precipitation limiting tree growth and more about that frequency of disturbance. So this map here, a little bit hard to see, but this is the predi uh, pre uh, predicted fire intervals that we used to have. Um, and again, it is really hard to see. But so this number here, this orange guy right here is every four to six years fire going through the landscape. So that's most of Virginia. Uh, most of the sort of coastal plain, kind of half the Piedmont of Virginia was burning once every four to six years. Now, it was a longleaf pine savanna for that reason. Um, again, it was a forest, but a different kind of forest. Um, so in that longleaf pine savanna, we had a massive amount of what we would now call meadow plants, grassland species, herbaceous species. Um, and so, uh, and same, you know, in the Midwest. Uh, rather than a savanna, again, the precipitation was limiting tree growth, so it's just herbaceous plants. Um, but no matter what, wherever these species were, in, even in the east, you know, herbivores were a big part um, of our habitats here. You know, Buffalo, New York, you wouldn't think of New York as uh, 
kind of having the same habitat as like, you know, North Dakota or something, but bison were in New York, elk were in, you know, like Philly, you know, these, these large herbivores that ate this vegetation were everywhere because the vegetation was everywhere. Um, so to survive in this context, um, a lot of these plants are germinating right after a disturbance event, right after a fire blows through, now we have bare soil. So we have bare soil and these little guys don't have much competition, but they know that, well, they don't know, but you know what I mean, evolutionarily, they know um, there's gonna be a fire soon. There's gonna be a disturbance event soon. If they don't develop super deep roots, they're going to die pretty quickly, either by being grazed um, or by fire burning through. Um, so they will spend a lot of time developing root tissue and then they will start to grow above ground. Um, so when we plant them, we can't really expect them to grow above ground very much for the first year. Um, they are spending a lot of energy developing that root tissue, which would enable them to survive the next fire or being trampled by bison. Um, here, we don't have to really worry about that now in 2022, um, but we do have to be patient because they are spending their time developing the root tissue first. Um, and so uh, then after they get that root tissue developed, they can start to grow vegetatively so that they can send even more energy to the roots and then they will start reproduction. Um, we do have some herbaceous species that are annuals that I really highly recommend including in your seed mixes. Um, I think I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit, um, but for the most part, these are, these are perennials that will last quite a long time on the landscape. And another thing uh, we talk about, I, I, I believe I talked about carbon sequestration a little bit. Um, most of the, the carbon that gets sequestered by grassland is in the soil because of these, this root tissue that's developing. Whereas in a forest, it is, is typically in the tree biomass itself. Um, so little, little kind of fun differences there. And then here too, I did want to point out, this is turf grass, so nothing, basically. Um, uh, ecologically, uh, uh, you know, sterile. Um, okay, so there are two approaches to doing this, to restoring meadow habitat. Um, the first one is not one that I recommend doing, but it's one that some people have done before. I do want to include it. I want to talk about it mostly to dissuade anyone from trying it. So you can, and again, I've seen it happen successfully, but you know, I don't recommend it. You can, you can stop mowing and then manage what comes up. If you stop mowing and just let the fescue be the fescue, that's not a meadow. Um, that's not a grassland. That's just overgrown, you know, fescue. Um, uh, and something that I would really caution is once you let it start growing, you are going to get reseeding of species. Um, you are going to get other species kind of rearing their heads that maybe were being suppressed by a mower. Um, you're going to start to get some issues developing in here that are going to um, uh, require more advanced solutions. Um, and so you're, it's going to be harder to do that second version of starting from scratch, killing everything, if you let things go for a little while first. And I also say that because in my experience, when I'm working with private landowners, they sign up for my program to convert their lawn to a meadow. Um, and then I say, awesome, we'll have a contractor out to spray herbicide um, in you know, late August. Um, and maybe this is May and the landowner doesn't mow all summer. And so we get stuff getting nasty in there uh, all summer long. So we, we wanna make sure that it, it stays mowed um, before we do that, you know, that second step of starting from scratch. Um, where we're going to kind of replicate those ecological conditions that these species evolved under, where we have no competition that we're starting with. Um, so again, I don't recommend doing this. If you're going to do this, um, you're going to have to be very vigilant against invasive plants, especially herbaceous invasive plants, because they're going to be harder to see. When still grass gets in here, you're done. Um, when you're not done, you can counter it, but it's going to be hard. Um, and uh, also, I highly recommend you're not going to get much success from overseeding. Um, uh, you're, you're going to really have to establish a ton of plugs into this tissue and then expect for a lot of those plugs to not make it, to get swallowed up by the grass vegetation. So again, don't recommend doing this, but it is possible to pull off. So what I do recommend doing, starting from scratch, there's a couple ways to do this. You're going to have to kill everything before you start, because again, we're replicating those, those conditions. Um, the organic approach, if, if a, a resident wants to go the organic approach, um, uh, uh, using solarizing as a technique is one way to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, having this half acre of plastic 
um, because you're trying to be more environmentally friendly and not spray herbicide, I think is a little questionable. Uh, and then another way to do it would be shallow tillage, where basically once a month prior to the fall seeding date, um, over the whole growing season, you, you do a shallow disking, just a, a, about an inch into the soil. Um, so basically you're just killing, you're just keeping this area dead all summer long. Um, you know, yeah, if a landowner doesn't want herbicide for the environmental downsides, these are both pretty bad environmentally. Um, you're really nuking your soil health by doing that um, with the shallow tillage. Um, and again, plastic is uh, also a petrochemical with pretty nasty environmental considerations. So, you know, just throwing that out there. Um, it's a free country. People can go organic if they want, but we're using herbicide to increase vegetative diversity here. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a tool for environmental progress. Um, on the note of, uh, of organic um, options, um, I've done this before in a pinch. Um, the old mold board plow. So we really usually, I've been working my whole kind of private land conservation career to um, recommend farmers going no-till, not tilling, um, but this will do it. This will invert the soil. You only have to do it once because that, that, that mold board cuts and, and scoops the, the soil over. Um, uh, so it's completely inverted um, and you're burying your seed bank. Um, so you plow it once, two weeks before seeding, you disc it right before the seeding to loosen up the clumps and you go ahead and broadcast seed. Um, but be very, 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 very careful about erosion. Don't do this on slopes. Don't do this near streams and make sure you use a cover crop. Um, and again, this is bad for the soil. You're killing everything in the soil when you do this. Um, so, you know, sometimes you got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet, but just kind of keep that in mind. Um, now, what I would recommend doing is herbicide. Again, um, we're using it as a tool to increase vegetative diversity. Um, not as a tool to decrease vegetative diversity. The reason why herbicide is bad for the environment, the reason why herbicide is attributed to pollinator declines is not just the existence of the chemical, it's because everyone sprays it everywhere to kill everything that's not just grass. Um, we're, again, we're flipping that over. We're doing the opposite um, to increase vegetative diversity. So I would recommend a broad spectrum herbicide, you know, so you want to kill anything in there, the, your grasses and your broadleaf uh, plants. Um, and uh, generally, I have found that two applications are good enough to kill most lawns. Um, I would recommend um, shooting for a fall seeding, because if you miss, then you can still have the spring seeding. Whereas if you're shooting for a spring season, a spring seeding, and things don't really line up, and you have to do another herbicide application, you can kind of run out of time, and then you have the whole summer with a, just a dead field. Um, with weeds able to creep in and, and start to take over. And so um, what I would recommend doing is spraying in about September and then about a month later, spraying any green up that you get. Um, and then you can seed in kind of late October, early November is my preferred um, uh, time to do meadow seeding. Um, if you get a green up after that second spray, again, and you've built in enough time, you can either try a third spray that autumn or you can just punt to winter um, and, and try again in the spring. Um, and then another, another great you know, benefit of herbicide is that it is quite affordable. Um, you know, glyphosate is one of the products that we kind of, you know, um, is, it's just really broadly applicable and it's cheap, um, but a lot of landowners kind of, you know, will clutch pearls about it. So you all know the drill, just, just be careful. Um, another kind of note um, to, uh, to, to put out there about kind of the benefits of herbicide, is that if you're just killing lawn grasses, you're not going to have a lot of kind of um, collateral damage. It, lawns are are basically um, you know ecologically sterile, so there's not that many critters in them to be killing. So if you're spraying a lawn, quite safe. Okay, I'll stop beating that dead horse. Um, if the property is large enough, if the meadow seeding area is large enough, I would recommend seeding with a native no-till drill. So you can see uh, it's a no-till drill, just like a corn plant or something, but it has these special um, seed boxes that are, are going to agitate the seed. A meadow seed is very, very light and fluffy. And if you don't have an agitator, it just won't fall down um, into the slots um, and into the soil. Um, the reason why I recommend doing this is because we're not disturbing the soil. So we're not opening up Pandora's box of the seed bank. Uh, who knows what's in there? Might be some good stuff, probably mostly bad stuff. Um, and so we have a nice advantage, competitive advantage against the weeds that are going to be in there. Um, but a lot of sites are going to be a little bit too small to do that feasibly. So what I recommend doing um, is uh, completely removing the debris 
Um, you obviously don't have to do that with hand tools. You can do it with, with you know, a tractor too, um, but uh, it might be a good idea to do this, wait a couple weeks, maybe spray again if there's any green up. But the thing is, we're gonna need really good contact between the soil and the seeds. So if you have residue on the surface, you're not gonna uh, have a very good seeding application. Um, so here's a site, a lawn conversion site. Um, it was pretty late uh, when the seeding was, and this is one that we, um, the contractor did, you know, scour the residue away. And you can see these bigger things are all the weeds that came out to play um, after that scouring. And then all these little tiny guys, those are our seeded species. So utility knife there for scale. You can see our partridge pea, Camicrista fasciculata, one of my favorites right in here amongst all these, you know, quote unquote weeds um, that aren't too, too bad, you know, wood sorrel and, and nut sedge and whatever, but um, you don't want them to choke out all the stuff that we spent, you know, uh, $550 per acre, you know, seeding. Um, so uh, on the note of seeding, um, there's a bunch of uh, uh, companies that will sell uh, native seed um, in mixes. Uh, I kind of recommend getting a mix. Um, you can get one that suits the soil. Uh, make sure it is mostly perennials. Don't just buy something at Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, don't just buy something at any company online. Make sure it is a company that, that specializes in conservation seeds. You're going to want to make sure there's a lot of uh, diversity of, of native uh, species in there and make sure there's a lot of grasses in there too because they really perform well um, for a lot of our, our benefits of meadows. Um, and it's not like it, it looks ugly with grasses in there too. They're, they're quite beautiful as they develop. Um, I would recommend a cover crop if you're using, if you're, if you're planting over a larger area. Um, and then another thing we do, uh, we use filler uh, to make sure you get a good spread of the seed across the site because it is so light and fluffy. Sometimes it can be hard to, you know, broadcast uh, that easily. So I usually use uh, either two to one of filler to, um, uh, to seed, or sometimes I'll use a little bit more. Um, folks use all sorts of stuff, sand, kitty litter. I've used potting soil, um, anything inert that's going to, you know, allow you to spread. But I, I have never been able to find a non-clumping kitty litter, and I don't want it to clump if there's any moisture in there. I'm also not a cat person, so maybe I'm not really looking at the right places. Um, so again, you're going to want to seed in the dormant season. I would recommend splitting up the seed into two containers, you know, uh, big Rubbermaid bins or, um, or buckets or trash cans or whatever. Um, you want to do one pass um, with your seed, with half the seed, and then you want to do the other pass perpendicular to that first pass. So you're getting good spread. Um, and then I recommend if you have it available, a turf roller or something, a culpa packer, um, to get that good contact with, this, uh, with the soil. Um, if you don't have that, you can just drive a truck or an ATV back and forth and back and forth. Or what I, my favorite is I have volunteers just go all walk out. Just go walk around, just go mill around, drink your coffee, have your snacks out there, just walk around and talk. And by the end, it's all squished in. Or if I'm doing it with kids, they just have them go run around and play. Um, uh, so this is gonna be a little counterintuitive because we just spent a lot of money, you know, seeding these things. And I'm sorry, I'm going a little over, Dave. I'm gonna try to try to um, uh, speed things up here. Um, uh, but you do want to mow in the first year. Um, it's not always necessary, but uh, if you aren't um, kind of an expert at herbaceous plants, it might be better for you to do this as, as a precaution to make sure that all that we have seeded um, is, is what's going to stay in there. If we don't mow at all, then anything that's going to go to seed in that first year is almost certainly not native. Um, and so it is going to reseed, um, and while it's in there reseeding, it's going to be smothering or at least competing with the stuff that we have seeded. So what I recommend doing is when the vegetation gets about 12 inches off the ground, mow it down to about eight inches off the ground. And that eight inch number is very, very, very important because the meristematic tissue for these plants is typically about six to eight inches off the ground. So if you mow lower than that, you're gonna kill the stuff that we seeded. Um, and uh, yeah, so recommend mowing about 12 inches down to about eight inches. Um, obviously, if it goes higher than that, um, that's fine. You just really want to make sure it's not going to seed. Um, and if nothing grows over, you know, 12 inches, then, you know, you had a very, very good herbicide application and, and you don't have to mow. Um, so again, we can't really expect too, too much the first year. It doesn't look like what people want it to look like right away because they're spending their time developing that root tissue. So that site I showed you earlier, uh, with that kind of not ideal weed control. Here it is, looks pretty great. We see there's tons and tons and tons of stuff in here. Some of it isn't 
is those weeds, but most of it is is the natives. Um, now, one of these I have been I I mowed it um, with a string trimmer actually because I couldn't get uh, brush hog in there, um, which is 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 possible. Um, this over here didn't need the the prep was adequate, so you can see the cover crop, the oats are are senesced in here, um, and uh, yeah, the the plants are just busy developing those roots. Uh, we're not going to really be able to see that much, but you can see we do have partridge pea blooming. Uh, Rudbeckia, you know, Black Eyed Susan will also bloom in the first year. So those are important ones to, to put in there um, to convey to the landowner and their neighbors what this is, that it's not just this massive um, explosion of weeds. Um, and then by year two, we're going to start to see some color. Things are going to start to mature. At this point, you usually can stop mowing. Um, if you continue to mow through year two, um, you're going to mow down all these Rudbeckias and it can be just this like shock of yellow. Um, in year two before a lot of our other species have really started to bloom quite yet. Um, and then things will change over time. Just like with a forest, things are dynamic. Um, you're gonna get things changing over time. New species are gonna come in. Some of those early species like Rudbeckia, which is only a couple feet tall, is gonna get choked out by the Monarda and the false sunflower and things like that that you see in here. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and another note here with the height, you can, you can choose species mixes that are taller or lower. Um, I'd say most mixes are about this, about five feet tall. Um, and my wife is about five feet tall um, uh, for, for a reference there. Um, so maintenance, um, Dave is gonna talk a lot about, you know, his whole topic is gonna be um, invasive plant control. Um, so that's one of the primary things we are concerned about with the meadow maintenance. Um, these areas are gonna quickly proceed through succession because we've restored them to the point that we we have native vegetation in there and they're not going to restrict the growth um, of woody species, but you might not want woody species. You might want it to be a meadow. If you want it to be a meadow in perpetuity, you're gonna want to be disturbing it um, to prevent it from you know, becoming uh, woody. Also, a lot of woody invasive plants will creep in there. So what I actually recommend doing is mowing um, in the early spring. So actually about now, I've noticed in my little backyard meadow, I'm getting some green up getting some of my little sprouts of, of goldenrod and things to start going. So probably this weekend, maybe next weekend, because I have a lot of stuff, work stuff to do this weekend. Um, I'm going to just string trim it down to about four inches off the ground. So I am not going to touch any of my natives. Um, they are all still either in dormancy or tiny little guys. Um, but what that is going to do is that's going to nip up any little multiflora rose or bush honeysuckle that might have crept in. Um, if you're concerned with, you know, native trees moving in, you're going to get black locusts and red maple coming up in there for sure. Um, so you're going to be able to, to keep that down. I really don't recommend mowing before winter because one of the huge ways this benefits the environment is it is cover for songbirds um, and other uh, wildlife all winter long. If people like birds, they will love to sit there in the winter and watch the birds play in the meadow and, and you know, eat their seeds. Um, that are all on the ground in there. Um, and you definitely don't want to mow during the breeding season. Um, that's a big no-no. You're going to kill a lot of wildlife to do that. Um, this is also, and I'm sure Dave will talk about this a lot, this is the best time of year to find where your invasive plants are because they are greening up uh, earlier than anything else. So where do you buy seed? You know, we don't like to give kind of specific recommendations. Here's a few companies that I've had good luck with in the past. You will notice that one of them is based out of Pennsylvania, Ernst Conservation Seeds. Um, again, just really, really, really stick to those companies that are conservation seed companies um, and, and kind of, you know, shop around before you start to buy anything. If a company is good, they will have sort of sales reps who can actually talk to you about what mix is best for the site, ecology, all that kind of stuff. So I recommend using, you know, one of these companies um, and then make sure you're buying local ecotypes. Some of these companies are out in the Midwest, but they do have you know, mid-Atlantic ecotypes. So you don't necessarily want to be planting stuff that's from, you know, Minnesota, um, if you can find stuff that's from, you know, Virginia, Maryland, PA. Um, and again, make sure you got grasses in there. Not only are they super valuable for pollinators as nesting structures, overwintering structures, um, but they're really important for wildlife and they will reduce the overall cost of your seed mix because grass seed is cheaper than uh, wildflower seed. Um, okay, so again, there is some grant funding out there, especially in different places than PA. PA, the grant funding has kind of run out. Um, so I've kind of gone on a little bit. I'm going to very quickly um, zip through. Well, yeah, so this is actually self-explanatory. It's a golf course we did a lawn conversion on, and there's more traffic to the golf course now than there was prior to this. 
and people are talking about it a lot. Um, everyone is super excited about the meadow on the golf course, which is super cool. Um, here is a, a municipal park. You can see it wasn't um, too bad. They were doing like a low mow strategy. They're probably mowing about once a month, but still, you know, not very valuable ecologically. Um, so we actually did a tree planting here, but you can see the very large power uh, lines here, the transmission lines. And so we did meadow beneath them, trees everywhere else. So I thought this is a pretty cool example to share. Um, so this is, you can see that that uh, prep spraying was very good. Um, here's the planting day, had almost 100 volunteers out. This is, here we go, black locust, baby, you got to plant those pioneer species. This is April 2nd. This is July 18th. And look at that black locust coming out of the tube already. Those things are champions. Um, and then uh, 2020, you can see here, um, looking out, oh, yeah, and I'll go back one sec. So you can see where the seed drill was most successful. You can see the tufts um, of the of the seeded stuff coming up there um, in that killed uh, uh, meadow seeding area. And this here um, is the, the second year. So we have a little bit of color. We have some stuff coming in, but it doesn't really look like that kind of sea of wildflowers that people are anticipating. Um, here's a little bit closer in there what it looks like, but it is. It's great. It was doing really, really well. Um, and um, here is year three now. It, it looks pretty good. Um, there's more invasives in there than I would have liked, but you know, um, that's kind of across the board. So, okay. So sorry, Dave, I took a couple minutes of your time. I'll pass it over uh, to you now. Thanks. Oh, and, our, and we are answering questions afterwards. So we'll, we'll address these uh, in, a, in a bit. Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and jump in. this. I'm gonna take a little different approach than, um than Ryan did in the sense that I'm not gonna give you a lot of background. Now, one of the first webinars we did for natural area management, uh, they're all recorded. And I did give a lot of the background on invasives, kind of the why it's important to control them. And some of the talking points that you might be able to use with landowners and such are in that as well, particularly when dealing with herbicides. But the approach I'm gonna take is I'm gonna bring you back to our case study property here. And I'm going to um, focus on this and I'm going to set up a scenario for you where you uh, come back to this property and deal with some of the invasive plant issues that are on the property itself. So I'm going to show you here where we go back to the landowner's goals here. And this landowner specifically mentioned in their goals and objectives here to manage or control invasive plants. And so we're going to focus on that. But I will say, you know, that that goal really, you know, and the impacts of invasive plants overlaps many of their other objectives as well. So the less lawn to mow. So as Ryan pointed out, if we're taking lawn out uh, uh, from being mowed, there's likely going to be invasive plant problems that need to be addressed there. Um, healthier trees and wooded areas. And we saw from Joe's presentation last week that uh you know, we have a lot of these vine problems and such that whether you're dealing with kudzu or I'll talk about oriental bittersweet, uh, wisteria vine. So that is going to impact our, our trees. Uh, high deer impacts certainly are going to promote invasive plants because they're going to be browsing out the native plants and really allowing invasives to take hold, improving habitat for songbirds and pollinators. And so there's been a lot of work done. I'm not going to go into it, but really these um, invasive plants provide uh, less nutritious forage base and from a, from a seed production or a berry production, and as well as they host very few insects from the ability of songbirds to find food to feed their young from caterpillars and things like that. So that's another issue that is impacted by invasives and then improving stream water quality and habitat. And certainly around the stream on our property, our case study property, we don't want those stream banks to be full of nothing but invasive shrubs, for example. So we could have invasive uh, plants impacting all of these goals and objectives. So here was the woodland health assessment that Julianne went over. This falls into the habitat assessment one. So undesirable plants was one that was specifically highlighted there. And then you look at the management actions there. So you can come up with the specific recommendations. This property, we assessed it um, as a higher concern. So we did have an invasive, a pretty significant invasive plant problem that needed to be addressed. 
you know, the deer browsing was an issue, uh, the streamside quality was an issue. So those are other things that are being impacted by the invasive plants themselves. So here's what I did. I threw these invasives uh, into the property there. So I'll show you what I have here on the, on the property. These are where they occurred, what you found. This was when you took that assessment and you made your walk through. This is what you determined was on the property. And so I had the annuals and mile a minute vine and Japanese stilt grass. I had the perennial vine, oriental bittersweet, a number of different shrub species across the property, multiflora rose, barberry, olive, honeysuckles, privets. And then lastly, I had tree of heaven. And when you're doing your walkthrough, you're noting where these are located and the severity of the problem. And you're mapping these out so that you can identify what particular habitat unit on the property that you're finding them in. And so we'll talk about control here just real briefly. So you can't discount you know, the integrated approach to this, but I will tell you that you'll find to be most productive and most effective in your approach on invasive plant control, you're gonna be landing on herbicides more often than not. I will show you a few other opportunities, particularly around the manual mechanical controls. Um, there are some biological controls out there, particularly um, for multiflora rose, mile a minute vine, it's suggested that we can get some effectiveness with biocontrols. Uh, we're working on a biocontrol for tree of heaven, but really we just don't have those options available to us yet. So I think you're going to find that more often than not, you're going to be you're going to be talking with landowners about how to get herbicides on the property to control these invasives. And I talk about them as being low risk, effective, selective, and necessary when you're dealing with these severe invasive plant problems. Um, I think one thing to really keep in mind, and probably one of the best talking points that you can use, is simply that these are 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 applied very selectively in small quantities, um, we're spot treating or individually stem treating these things. So these are not broadcast treatments of large quantities of herbicide. As most people are familiar with production agriculture or even some of the treatments that they may be familiar with on people's lawn, this is very different than how we're applying herbicides in, um, in these natural area kinds of settings. And so where do we start? And I like to tell people to start in the least invaded areas first. So we're gonna to try to save the best. We're gonna to try to prevent that spread. We're gonna um, really try to save the areas that have the largest populations of native plants still present. And we're gonna to try to maintain areas of very low invasive plant impact. And then next we're gonna move into areas that we can rescue. We can rescue the existing native plant community. So the next place we do have invasive problem in there, but we also have some native plants that are just now starting to be overtaken by them. They haven't yet been displaced. That's gonna be where we're gonna move into next. And then lastly, we're gonna tackle those areas that are just dominated by invasive plants. The areas not been completely, or the areas that are completely occupied by invasives. This is gonna be the most difficult job, the most expensive. And this is only after we've achieved success and control on these other two areas first that we move into the worst. And most people don't realize that they don't really see it that way because what jumps out to them are these areas that are just dominated. And maybe some properties you'll get to that the whole property is dominated and that's, and it doesn't really give you that choice. But I will tell you, if you do have a choice, start to work in those least invaded areas first and keep them that way and move towards those worst sections there. And this is kind of a drawing that I made. And if you look at this arrow across the top, this is where the invasive plants have just dominated here and they're moving into new uh, habitats, into new areas that they still have good native plant growth, but there's few invasives there. And this is the way we're gonna control it. So we're gonna work out here first and move into these areas. And we're gonna save that best first and keep this area from looking like this. And that's gonna be a way to get started. And so really you can do a lot of this work with a crew of folks with simply using backpack sprayers. A um, Couple of other things to go with it, your shoulder saver harness. If you're doing a lot of basal bark work, the low volume basal wand, which has the shut off right at the tip there, it's gonna save you a tremendous amount of product if you're doing a lot of basal work. Uh, if you're doing hack and squirt on Tree of Heaven, for example, 
you know, you're going to want just a simple hatchet and spray bottle. You know, you want the storage container so that you're, um, you're transporting this stuff appropriately. And then a couple modifications on your backpack, not just the shoulder saver harness, but you can put a check valve right in the tip there. So it'll have a shut off in the tip itself. And then an assortment of adjustable cone brass spray tips from very small apertures that you would use for basal bark applications to larger apertures for foliar spraying. And then of course, read the label on the products and I'll talk about some of the products here, but make sure that you're wearing appropriate personal protective equipment. So rubber boots are gonna be real important. Uh, long sleeve shirts, long pants, eye protection, uh, rubber gloves, and, and really for any of the products that I'm gonna show you here, that's what's required. In fact, this is actually going above and beyond what's required. Uh, for many of them that I will show you here. Some that I will recommend don't even um, advise that you wear gloves uh, when you're spraying. That's how uh, low in toxicity some of these active ingredients are. And so, as I mentioned, you know, with a crew of folks that know how to identify these plants and can effectively spray them, they've gone through the calibration exercise, which I'll mention at the end here, uh, they can be pretty effective at controlling uh, these invasives on a property. So a couple additional things that you might want to consider beyond simple backpack sprayers would be, of course, a chainsaw, because uh, you're going to see that with some of these, that's where you're going to start is with cutting these plants and forcing them to re-sprout, killing the aerial portion just by simply cutting it. Uh, backpack mist blowers, so if you have large areas that you're broadcast treating, you know, getting a mist blower might be a, a time saver for you. And then some areas that may be completely over, overrun with invasives, you're going to start with something like this. And it may not be that you own this piece of equipment, but it may be that you contract it on a particular property. And simply what this is going to do is going to provide you that access to come back and actually do the spraying. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I show you the shrub section here of my presentation. So what do you need as far as herbicide active ingredients are concerned? You know, glyphosate and triclopyr are going to be probably the two most common active ingredients we're going to utilize. And most often for our foliar applications, we're actually mixing the two together. And it's really important that you understand that to give you this broader spectrum of control. A couple other products that you would likely invest in would be metsulfuron methyl and sulfometron methyl. And I'll I'll show you where that actually comes into play as well. For our shrubs, we're going to be typically mixing all three of these together, doing foliar applications. Uh, this is going to be for some of our annuals. There's a few other products that you want to uh, make note of here as I go through some of the annuals, but for the most part with those four active ingredients, you can get what, done what you need to do. A couple caveats, you want to make sure it's labeled for use in your state and labeled for use in the area or the site that you're applying it to. So not every glyphosate label, for example, is labeled for use in wooded areas or in forests. And so you wanna make sure that the site that you're applying it to is on the product label that you've actually purchased. So if you're applying it into the wooded areas, then you need to have it listed on the label. And so that's really important that you're purchasing the correct product. So bringing you back to our, our case study property, uh, the old pasture here, this is an old abandoned pasture. It has in, been invaded now with our annual mile minute vine. So I'm gonna quickly run through kind of a scenario and how you might approach that. And of course, the first step is to identify this plant and make sure that you know you're dealing with the right thing. So this is an annual, Climbing thorny vine, thorny vine grows 20 to 30 feet in a single growing season. So it's germinating from seed and growing that length in one year. Triangular leaves with these round leaf-like structures that you see on here, small curved barbs. And then you can see the fruit. When the fruit is ripe, it turns that, uh, that iridescent blue color. And it can be quite severe. This is an overgrown area at uh, one of our state parks here, not too far from where I live. So it will over completely overtop vegetation and just completely smother it out. The keys to controlling, uh, you know, this is an annual. So we want to prevent it from, from going to seed. We want to prevent it from setting that seed each year. We want to treat it when it's small, treat it early in the season, 
in persistence because that seed remains viable in the soul for five years. And so you have a, an uphill battle ahead of you trying to prevent this thing from going to seed each year. Uh, it does pull easily. So that's one of the benefits of it. So if you encounter small infestations, you can very easily pull this out. Um, I would recommend, unlike this individual, that you're wearing long sleeves like I have on here. So rub, lo, um, leather gloves and long sleeves, and you can be very effective at pulling these small infestations. You'll probably read if you're pulling it when the seed is ripe is to bag it and haul it off site. But I will tell you, if you're pulling it when the seeds are ripe, you're knocking the seeds onto the ground and you're going to be back next year either way. So I would suggest that you simply make compost piles of what you've pulled and leave them right on site, knowing that you're going to be back there for a number of years and keep monitoring that site. But you can be very effective with this plant simply by pulling it and uh, leaving piles on the property. Your whole objective with this plant is to preserve other native plants, prevent it from smothering vegetation out. And I'll show you why that's important here. Some of the herbicides that you can use that are very effective with this would be some of the pre-emergent products. So these are products that specifically work only on the process of seed germination. So if you have desirable uh, forbs and other herbaceous species present there, using a pre-emergent product is not going to harm them. It's only going to act on the seed germination process. It's important that it's in the in the ground, where those seeds are, when they germinate. So early applications are really important. Um, you can use other selective products like the sulfometron, but that will take out other grasses and other herbaceous plants, but it does not harm trees. And so if you're dealing with this in a wooded situation and you have desirable trees growing in there, you have desirable seedlings present, you can use a product like sulfometron and it won't harm tree seedlings even being sprayed directly over the top. Um, these foliar applications with glyphosate and triclopyr, those are non-selective. And so I don't typically advise using that unless it is nothing but mile a minute binding. You don't have any non desirable non-targets there that you're trying to preserve. And the other key to this is that you're really trying to preserve shade. And so this is a, a very sun demanding plant. And if you can get vegetation to grow up through it, eventually you can shade it out. So if this was in one of your tree planting areas, for example, keeping those trees that you planted growing, get them up above it. And eventually this plant will become a non-issue in those areas. All of the plants that I'm gonna show you here in this scenario have these treatment and timing tables. And these are all in our fact sheets that you can find on the extension website. And I'll mention that for you at the end. So I'm not gonna go into detail on these at all because you can find them on our fact sheet. Just know that they exist. And it really kind of lays out when you're using these various products and how you're using them. So the other annual that we had encountered was, encountered was Japanese stilt grass. And where that came in was along the trail. And it's likely that it was brought in on the equipment that built that trail. And so that's something that's really important to note. Uh, we see this quite often where people are moving equipment from one site to the next. They're transporting seeds of these invasive plants. And so if this trail was built or is maintained with equipment, it's likely gonna be moving and spreading that Japanese stillgrass seed around. And so this is another annual, it's a summer grass, it's a late season cedar. Uh, you won't find seed on it until very late into the growing season, but it has this sprawling growth habit, two to four feet. I've seen it even grow uh, five feet tall, but it just lays over in these real thick thatches, it has these lance shaped leaf blades with this uh, silvery off center uh, mid vein. And then this is where it gets its name. It has these stilt roots that grow off the stems and anywhere where that's laying along the ground, you actually see some of those uh, roots coming off of it. So mechanical control is really not very practical with this plant, but if you were to try to attempt this, and of course we're not looking for mowed ecosystems, right? So mowing is really not desirable, but your mowing objective would be to mow it late enough in the season that you prevent it from growing the seed and it doesn't have time to regrow and produce seed as well. So timing is really important. I did have one property owner 
Uh, they had a small acreage woodlot with some still grass in it where they hired a crew with string trimmers to go through there. But honestly, you know, missing one or two plants is enough to reseed those areas. And remember, that seed remains viable. So if it's been there for a while, you've got three, four, five years ahead of you, even if you prevented every plant from, from going to uh, seed, which is not practical. It's just really a tough plant. And probably on, on all this, you're tempering your expectations to control and never eradication things. These things you will not likely be able to eliminate uh, from a site. But the key, keys to control, control that seed bank, treat it early in the season. You'll hear I'm spraying it where it's completely dormant and I'm treating just that brown thatch, uh, three to five year uh, seed viability. And so you're looking at very similar products to what you would look at with uh, uh, mile a minute vine. So the pre, um, pre and post emergent products, um, I did add, um, well, actually, that, or here's the pre-emergent products. I'm sorry, right here is where I really meant to start in these. So these are just simply working on that, that seed germination. These products here, sulfametra and amazepic, actually have pre and post-emergent uh, viability. And they will work on seed as well as plants that have already emerged. And so this gives you a lot more flexibility on these annuals. If you're just using a pre-emergent and you have plants that have already germinated, they will not be controlled. But if you use something like this, it'll act on seeds in the soil as well as plants that have already emerged. Um, we'll talk a little bit more here about a Mazepic as well. Um, but these ones, these are not gonna work on that seed bank. These are grass specific products. So you can be very selective and you can just control grasses but what will happen is that seed bank is there in the next year, you'll have grass, just uh, still grass, just germinating back. And you can control it with glyphosate, but again, you're not affecting that seed bank. And so um, that's where I really get to not recommending these ones. I don't think they're very effective if you're not going to impact that seed bank. So you really got to consider that as your goal. I will mention this though, this is the Mazepic tolerant uh, plant. So Mazepic is a pretty unique product in that there's a lot of desirable native wildflowers and some warm season grasses even that are resistant to a Mazepic. And so if you get still grass into one of these meadows, you can take the still grass out and all of these plants. And this is actually an advertisement that I copied but a lot of companies are now making these Mazepic resistant seed mixes that you can utilize. And so if you have some of these already uh, established and you have still grass that you need to get rid of, uh, you can use the Mazepic, which is in a, a product called Plateau. And so kind of a neat product there. If you look at the label, there's a lot of really desirable stuff that is resistant to a Mazepic. And so here's the treatment and timing table. So I'm only including the pre emergent products, as well as the pre and post emergent products, the sulfametron or mazepic on there for still grass. And these would be effective just the same on the uh, mile a minute vine as well. So moving on to our perennial vine. So this is uh, where we're finding the oriental, oriental bittersweet on the property grown along the woods edge, along the back of the lawn, as well as over here between the pasture and our mature woods. And so Oriental Bittersweet is this deciduous twining woody vine, 60 feet, six inches in diameter, alternate elliptical finely toothed leaves. And of course those round yellow fruits that split open to expose those red berries in there uh, later into the season. And so look for these um, uh, really easy to identify and locate once you know what you're looking for. And so keys to control this, this is a little different now because this is a root suckering species which means that we're gonna be targeting our herbicide applications from mid to late summer so that we really get the best translocation down to the roots. And I will caution you that cut vines will re-sprout vigorously from the, from the cut stump as well as from the root system. And if you're mowing areas uh, that have oriental bittersweet, it might be great to provide you access, but it will literally turn that area into a carpet of, um, Oriental bittersweet, if you're not careful and you're mowing it continuously. And again, long seed viability. So you can have years of seeds that can be in that soil that you've got to be cognizant of. 
So what I recommend with the bittersweet issue on this property is this two-step approach. And our first step is gonna be to kill this aerial portion. We wanna preserve that tree health. We wanna keep it from strangling these uh, existing uh, trees. So we're cutting these vines. We're cutting them typically in the winter time, um, which is my preferred time to go through there because what that allows you to do is uh, come back in mid to late summer after that plant has had a chance to regrow and treat those re-sprouts. So we're cutting it and I typically recommend what's called a window cut. So you're cutting it here at this level, but then you're also cutting it off at the ground and that's gonna facilitate your access when you come back in there in mid to late summer to actually do the foliar treatment. And so fall coloration is great. It really does make it easy to find. And so when you're looking for this plant, learn to recognize this color. This was the view from my tree stand actually this last year on a property that I had permission to hunt, but you can see that unique lime green color. And so once you learn to recognize that, you'll see this plant growing all over the place. So that's a good time to do some scouting for it on some of your properties and know that you've got to come back and cut these vines this winter to kill these aerial portions. Once you cut them, you want to make sure that you flag those vines in some way, uh, note their location so that you know where they are so you can come back and treat those re-sprouts because this thing will uh, stump sprout and root sprout just vigorously after it's cut. You can hack and squirt larger stems. Uh, late season glyphosate typically is effective with it. It does translocate well through root systems. Um, stump treatments can be done. Not typically something that you need to worry about. A few individual fines, sure, go ahead and treat them no matter what time of year you're cutting them. But when you have a massive infestation, you can literally have hundreds of vines. And there's really no sense to treat all those cut surfaces uh, it's typically going to just kill that stump and prevent it from sprouting and not really translocate well through the, the whole root system. So it's likely that you're going to be back anyways. Um, and, and it's just not practical to just treat all those cut surfaces. So cut it one plant or two vines, you know, treat it. If not, then uh, know that you're coming back to spray that spray the re-sprouts and you can basil bark it. So as long as it's not tightly twined around, you know, desirable plant, or growing up, uh, you know, your prized tree, then you, know, you can do basil bark applications on these vines as well. There's the treatment and timing table. Uh, really important to note that all of my herbicide treatments uh, are not before uh, July 1. So once we move into this time of year, right up until we start to see fall color, um, we can get good translocation down to roots. We're doing our window cutting any time of year. But again, I would prefer to do that in the wintertime so that now I've got this portion of the growing season to get re-sprouts up so that I can then treat them. So one of the other issues that we found were multiple different species of shrubs on the property. And these were located across all areas. So we had them in the old pasture invading. We had them in the young woods as well as the mature woods. So a lot of these are sun loving species, but some like Japanese barberry will grow in dense shaded woodlands even. And so we had a, a quite a, a, a selection of them, multiple a rose, barberry, olive, shrub, honeysuckles, privets, you name it. We found it on this particular property. And they're probably some of the most common and problematic species that you're gonna encounter. So again, I'm not gonna go into identification on these, but learn how to identify these things, how to differentiate them from native plants. There are some native lookalikes in some of these things, particularly some of the opposite branch shrubs. Uh, shrub honeysuckles are opposite branched. And so make sure that you're not confusing that with some of our shrub dogwoods or show some of our um, viburnums, for example. So make sure that um, you and or your crew know how to identify these guys when you're scouting these properties and noting locations and severity of the infestations. Um, they do pull, uh, particularly shrub honeysuckle, it's a very shallow rooted species and you can pull that out of the ground under um, moist soil conditions. This is actually a uh, shrub honeysuckle that I pulled on my own property where I've um, pretty much eradicated the shrubs on it. Uh, weed wrenching tools like this, I have tried those, but I can tell you that is a lot of work 
lugging that thing around. And they're not very effective for multi-stem species, uh, single stem species, maybe like Bradford pear or Norway maple, they might be effective on or more effective on, but it is a tough, tough jo job to pull those down. We have done some flame weeding. Uh, flame weeding will kill the top of the plant as you girdle it with the heat there, but typically they are just simply re-sprouting following that. Um, it does provide you access into some areas and multiple treatments like this could be effective on, the, on these plants and some of them to control it, but uh, it's not a super effective approach. And again, it's pretty labor intensive where you're going to have to clear that uh, the leaf litter away or you're doing this under wet conditions so that you don't have a fire hazard and then you're applying this multiple times throughout the year to try to prevent that plant from renewing its root system we call it carbohydrate starvation starving those roots cutting alone is not an effective approach so if you go in there and just simply cut these things are re-sprouting vigorously and you're going to turn, you know, a few stems into many and you're going to be right back where you started if you're not following cutting with some type of herbicide control. And again, you know, multiple mowings is really not what we're after, but sometimes it's what we need to do to start this operation. You know, something like this, a skid steer with a heavy duty brush hog or like the fecon pull, bull hog with the rotary uh, uh, mower on the front there is going to get us into these sites and we're going to mow this stuff down to provide access because we just have no way to get started. This is really a non-selective approach because uh, sometimes you can identify some clumps of native plants out there, but typically you're mowing uh, everything completely down and starting everything over again. So these are all re-sprouting. What you're going to do is allow it to grow for a season or two. So now the, the plants are need to waste high at the most. And you're coming back and very selectively treating those re-sprouts. So this was uh, foliar applications. You can see how we can very selectively go in and just spot treat these individual plants. You can also do this with basil bark applications, which I'll show you. So very selectively let them re-sprout and selectively treat them to control them. So the other thing to keep in mind is that these invasive plants have this, what's called extended leaf phenology, where they're leafing out early in the spring. We're seeing it in some areas already now that the shrub honeysuckles are just starting to bust their leaves open and you can start to really find these things. They also hang on to their leaves later and in, into the fall as well. And what that really allows you to do is it gives you this longer uh, foliar application spray window but it also helps you locate the shrubs in the springtime because what I like to do in the spring is do a lot of early season basil bark applications. So we're going to start actually next week doing some basil bark applications on invasive shrubs because the leaves are just popping out. We can look across the woodlot. It's the only thing up. It's the only thing green. And we can be very precise and very specific in our applications this time of year with basil bark. Now, once the leaves completely open up, uh, we're into that June window typically, maybe late May, and then we can move over to foliar applications. But these early season basil bark applications allow us to be very precise in our applications. Um, so I think this, yeah, there it is. This is a video I'm going to show you of a basil bark application so you can see how it's done. So you're treating that lower 12 to 15 inches of the stem from the ground line up to about 12 to 15 inches. Hopefully my mic is working now, but I'll stop this video. Hopefully you were able to see that. So that's a basal bark application. So you're using triclopyr ester formulations mixed in a basal bark oil. The oil is the carrier, the penetrant that moves the herbicide through, through the bark into the vascular tissue. And it's super selective. This is a Japanese barberry that I treated in early spring. And you can see there's an oak seedling right here. None of the leaves were out on anything. So there's a sugar maple when I made that application, but you can see the barberry is now completely dead. You can also cut things and treat stumps. So if the landowner does not want these dead plants in the woods, you can cut them. 
you can haul them out, you can chip them, you can make brush piles, whatever you need to do with them. Um, but then you need to treat these cut surfaces. If you're using water-based products, you're treating them immediately just to cut surface. Oil-based products like triclopyr ester, you can come back and treat them anytime as long as you can find it, but then you're treating not only the cut surface, but you're also treating the sides of the stump as well. So it's more like a basal bark application when you're using oil-based stuff. And you can do that year round. You'll see in the treatment and timing label, if you're cutting and treating stumps, you can do those treatments year round, particularly with the oil-based products and then foliar application. So we recommend this broad spectrum mix. So typically we're not only just mixing the glyphosate and the triclopyr, but if you have um, a lot of multiflora rose on a site, you're gonna wanna add some met sulfur on to that with a, at a very, very low rate, only an ounce per acre uh, into your backpack spray mix. And that's going to give you this broad spectrum control. Remember on this property, we had what five or six different shrub species uh, present. Um, and if you do, and most sites do, then this broad spectrum mix is going to get you control on, on all those. We found that, um, for example, shrub honeysuckle is very effectively controlled with glyphosate, but put glyphosate on an autumn olive and you don't get it. And then reverse is true. You can uh, very effectively control autumn olive with triclopyr. We'll put triclopyr on, an, on a shrub honeysuckle and you don't get it controlled. Mix them together, got same plants on one site. Now you can go out and pretty much treat everything. The other thing it gives you the flexibility to do is if you find a tree of heaven, if you find um, an oriental bittersweet, you know, what other else it might be out there. This is not just a shrub mix. This is gonna allow you to treat it while you're on site. So here's the treatment and timing label. Remember, these are not root suckering species. So your spray window is much longer. And once you get full leaf out, right up until you know fall coloration, you can do foliar application. And then basal bark and stump treatments, you're looking at a really long operational window. I probably wouldn't recommend you doing it in the dead of winter when everything is frozen and dormant. But once you start to move into the you know, late winter, early spring window, you can start to do some of these applications. Stump treatments, I will caution you, if you cut plants and you have sap coming out of that stump, you're not gonna effectively control it. You're gonna wanna use basal bark applications in that spring sap flow window particularly. Okay, so that's, that's one thing to certainly keep in mind. So the last one I'm gonna cover here and then we'll open it up for questions is the tree of heaven. So we also found uh, tree of heaven on this particular property as well. And this is another one that's pretty challenging to get a, get a handle on. These things grow huge, large trees, 80 feet, four feet in diameter is not uncommon for them to grow to that size. That uh, smooth pale gray bark when they're old or the bark like this when they're younger, it looks kind of like the skin on a cantaloupe actually. Uh, these stout blunt twigs, pinnately compound leaves. So this is one leaf. This is a compound leaf. This is a yardstick. So this one is three feet long. These are leaflets. Each one of these along that stem, you can have as many as you know, 11 to 25 leaflets on one leaf. The papery seeds that remain on only the female trees in the wintertime. So it has separate male and female. And of course, once you learn the odor, you'll never forget uh, what a tree of heaven is. So this plant is easily confused with other compound leaf trees, particularly those that grow in similar clonal patches. So tree of heaven being root suckering, it grows in these clonal patches where all of these trees are on the same root system. So don't confuse that with other clonal trees like uh, staghorn sumac, for example. And when you look at the leaves specifically, you'll see tree, <coughs> excuse me, the leaflets. You'll see the edge of the leaflets are mostly smooth except for these few little glandular teeth. If you were to flip this over and look at the underside, you would actually see a little gland right there. And so when you see these one, two, or sometimes even three glandular teeth right at the base of the leaflet, that's tree of heaven. All of our other compound leaf trees that you might confuse this with, except for maybe black locust, um, would have serrations or teeth along the edge of the margin. And then of course, this is the twig broken open and you have that brown spongy center in the twigs there. So keys to control root suckering species, just like oriental bittersweet means mid to late summer herbicide treatments. 
and we're going to use that tree system to move that that herbicide downward and follow up is absolutely critical in year two. You can see this is the parent tree and all of these are root suckers growing off its root system. Cut trees will re-sprout vigorously from stumps and roots. So here's one that was cut. You can see the sprouts coming off of it. This was a research plot, cut no herbicide treatment, one growing season afterwards. This was a spring herbicide treatment. You can see there's our research plot in there. All the herbicide went up. Tops of the trees are killed. No herbicide went down to the roots and you can see the root system is re-sprouting. So timing is really critical. Don't cut it unless you're gonna herbicide it first. And I'll show you why. Uh, you can pull new ceilings, but not root sprouts. If it's attached to a root system, it's likely you're just gonna break it off. So pulling is not, not an effective means of control. However, if you do need to simply cut it, no herbicides are allowed, take advantage of shade, cut it in June or early July. So it just spent reserves to push leaves out, cut it down, make it replenish those reserves or cut it down before it can replenish any of those reserves. Uh, cut trees before they get large, cut repeatedly and frequently. Remember that carbohydrate starvation is our objective there. We wanna prevent it from being able to make carbohydrates and move them back down to that root system. So, Herbicide treatments July to September or up until the onset of fall color because it's a root suckering species. We're going to use our standard glyphosate mix plus triclopyr, the water-based formulations, a hack and squirt. We can use either or glyphosate or triclopyr. My preference would be glyphosate. It moves a lot better through root systems than triclopyr water-based formulations do. And then basil bark, like you see in this image, with triclopyr ester mixed in a basil oil is pretty effective. I noted on that hack and squirt there that we need to use space cuts. Why space cuts? Because if you girdle the tree, it's basically um, cut off the cells, the phloem cells, which would move that herbicide down to the roots. And so this is where we completely girdle the stems using hack and squirt. You can see all the sprouts we have coming up. Here's where we left spaces between our cuts and not a single re-sprout in this particular clone. So leaving spaces between your cuts, like you see in this image right here, is really, is really important, okay? Now, what if you have to remove it? So a landowner doesn't want these dead trees on their property. What we recommend that you do is you cut it or you treat it first, wait 30 days and then come back and actually remove the tree. If you cut it and you just treat that stump, you're likely just gonna kill that stump and not affect the root system. And so that is not what we recommend that you do. Here's an example right here. This tree was cut, stump was treated. It's even actually trying to re-sprout right there, but it's pretty effectively controlled. But here's the sprout coming off its root system. So we killed the stump but there was no mechanism in that tree. That tree system was gone, so no way to move it downward to the roots. And so stump treatments do not control root sprouts. So there's the treatment and timing table. So again, root suckering species, late season applications for foliar, basil bark, or hack and squirt, very effective. Get that downward movement to the root system. Once the tree is controlled, then come back and cut it. Another caveat, with that that you need to be aware of. If it's a big tree that has to be pieced down and, and the landowner or homeowner wants that tree removed, you may not be able to kill it first because if the tree has to be climbed by a tree crew, for example, they probably aren't gonna climb a tree that's dead. And so you may have instances where you have to take tree of heaven down in advance while it's alive if you do that, make sure you treat the stump. You will likely kill that stump. You may still have some root sprouts to, to contend with. And so you wanna be sure to monitor that area. You likely will have root sprouts to deal with. Last thing I'll say is be sure to calibrate. You'll notice all of my herbicide recommendations on our fact sheets, um, which I'll show you here in a moment, but in the presentation, even they were all per acre. So think about that in a, in a sense of what you're treating. You have a rate that you're applying to that area. Even if you're treating just a small area, you still have a rate. 
And if you were to accumulate all these small areas that you treated, eventually you may treat an acre and um, we could actually cal calculate that rate that you applied across that acre. And that's how this fact sheet is set up. And so you're gonna spray a small area. It's gonna allow you to, cal to calculate your rate and that's going to allow you to mix appropriately based on these recommendations that we have uh, here. The name of the fact sheet is Backpack Sprayer Calibration for Woodland Applications. So look for that on the extension website as well. Always read the label and follow the directions. And then in summary, I'd say learn to identify invasive plants. You're scouting the property. You're mapping the species locations and the severity of the infestation so that you know where to start your work. You wanna implement control measures by pulling the small infestations and in plants, mowing large infestations, and then herbicides are by far gonna be your most productive approach. You wanna start in the least invaded areas first. You wanna follow up on all treatments absolutely necessary in year two, and then move into just this maintenance mode. So you're really front loading the operation, big crew, a lot of money, get things under control, and then schedule maintenance at least, if not every year, every other year where you come back to the property, you're scouting it again, and you're treating plants as necessary. So this is what our fact sheets look like. There's 14 of them in, in all currently, and so they provide you full color images on identification as well as those treatment and timing tables. And so with that, I am done, Andrew, and we can open it up for questions here. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Ryan, if you want to come back and join us, we will. Uh, there we are. Okay. Let me make sure that. Uh, go ahead and take some questions. Uh, this first one is actually uh, germane to some other, some other topics we've done, and it's something that I'm sure uh, Dave can touch on a little bit. Question is, has Penn State advocated and helped with the problem of overpopulation of deer? As Doug Tallamy has said, you cannot restore the woodlands and create natural environment in suburban areas where the overpopulation exists, which seems to be quite extensive in the state. If not, landowners like me would appreciate the leadership of Penn State at leading the discussion and the solution. Yeah, good question. And I did see that in there. So Number one, we're not allowed to do any kind of lobbying or advocating for things like that, but we certainly do a lot of educating. And so our education is focused on professionals, on landowners, you name it. And so there is a lot of that going on in that angle. Uh, I do work with our Society of American Forces chapter for Pennsylvania that provides testimony annually that is read not by a Penn State Extension or a Penn State professional, but it is read by one of our members to the game commission. And I would almost turn that around and I would suggest that all of you out there need to show up at these game commission meetings. And really they need to hear from you folks that you are having problems with deer because those are who they're gonna listen to as much as anyone in changing some of our regulations and liberalizing our season. I was just down in Maryland at a training with Andrew and some other folks and, uh, one of the extension fellows there was telling me how liberal the Maryland deer hunting season is in comparison to what we have as far as opportunities in Pennsylvania. And so we really need to make some, some significant changes, absolutely. And I would encourage all of you to make sure the Game Commission hears from you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm assuming this next one has, has to deal with, with herbicides. Uh, the question is, what is the cost per acre for the different types of controls? I don't have a good feel for that. I don't know if you do, Ryan, maybe with some of the contractors that you're, can, you're dealing with on your end. Really going to yeah. vary depending on what you're running into. Yeah, yeah, it definitely depends on a lot of stuff. But usually for, for some of this kind of, you know, spot treatment kind of stuff, combing through doing invasive shrubs and vines. It's, you know, anywhere probably $300, $500 per acre. Is that roughly what you're kind of seeing, Dave? Um, it also depends on where, you know, if it's one small site, 
that's kind of far from where they are, you know, this is where scale kind of really can, can impact things. Um, yeah, I was, you know, of course, I don't have real current prices in my head. My last experience, it was, it was lower than that, but, you know, maybe it does really depend on, on what, what the site is and what exactly you're dealing with and how severe the infestation is. I was hoping we were around the 250 an acre. <laughs> For some of our, and if it may be as good context, for some of our herbaceous, you know, treatments where we're, we're killing lawn, you know, cover with like tractor mounted stuff, it, it, it's a lot cheaper. It's, you know, yeah, like 150, 200 per acre for, a, you know, just a, a glyphosate spray. Um, so, yeah, hope that helps. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, Deborah asks, is cutting and painting bittersweet and porcelain berry vines with concentrated Garlon 3A in the spring effective? Andrew, before I answer that, I will make, make note to folks. Somebody asked about the CE link. You want to just mention how that link is going to be handled? Right. Yeah, I'm going to put that in the, in the chat box when we're, when we're uh, almost finished with the questions before everybody has a chance to leave. Yeah, look for that, folks, in the chat. So... <laughs> So treating stumps on uh, porcelain berry and Oreo and bittersweet in the spring, I would say is not gonna be your best option. I would suggest that you're simply cutting them at this time of year. Uh, you may just end up controlling those stumps. And if there's water coming out of them when you cut them, you're not getting any control whatsoever because it's pushing upwards this time. And you're trying to push those buds out and a lot of moisture is coming up through that root system of the plant. So probably not your best option to do that this time of year and on root suckering species like oriental bittersweet it's probably not going to buy you much and likely you're going to be back to spray uh, root sprouts anyways okay brian has a, a pair of questions we'll start with the the fashion one what are the pants or the chaps that the person in the video is wearing no, that might have been mine, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wondered if that was you or if you were doing the filming. No, where I was spraying with the basil bar herbicide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah those are actually just brush traps. Those are not herbicide traps. But when you're dealing, you know, out there and you're spraying around multiflora rose and Japanese barberry and such, you know, briar traps I have found to be essential to save my legs and also keep the herbicide overspray on them as you're constantly walking through this stuff. So rubber boots and uh, briar traps are a central part of my gear when I'm out there working on this stuff spraying. Okay, he's also wondering about Tree of Heaven. Is there a size diameter where Tree of, he tree of Heaven can be cut and removed without the 30 day comeback? For example, can a one inch sapling be cut and removed? Well, there may be, but I don't really know the answer to that, to be honest with you. There may be a point where it doesn't root sprout. But again, just keep in mind, our recommendation is that um, you kill it first and then wait, and come back and cut it down. If that's not possible, because the tree has to be climbed to remove it based on where it's located, maybe it's near a residence or something and they have to piece it down then by all means, go ahead and cut it first, treat the stump, but be cognizant that you may have root suckering that you're gonna be contending with. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one's for Ryan. You have a recommendation for a native wildflower mix that includes legumes or other forage for deer or a suggested blend that can be mixed on site Oh boy. Well, um, not really. We, uh, a lot of the times deer are kind of more, a little bit more of a pest while we're trying to get things established because they can hammer these areas in that, you know, early stage when we, we don't want them to. Um, and a lot of the times what we're kind of shooting for long-term is, is kind of more cover, um, than food in these mixes. So that's actually not really something that I've thought about much. Um, just caught off the top of my head. I wonder if it might make sense to, include a couple strips so you've done perfect site prep to seed maybe a different mix um maybe you can you know have a strip of say a classic like a clover or something you know mix um you know nearby 
uh, and that might even save your little guys that you you don't want to get um, you know chewed up because they're they're going to eat the other stuff. But we all know deer, and they'll they'll just kind of eat everything. So um, I don't know if that would work. I do know that I always see deer mixes um, on these um, company pages, but I've never I've never read them because I I'm usually not really that interested in that stuff. So. And are they are they deer mixes that are deer resistant to being browsed, or are they deer resistant from a food source perspective? The latter, like a cover, like a perennial cover or a perennial food plot kind of situation. Oh, okay. Okay. Which I think is wise. And then, you know, thinking about kind of long-term maintenance, but, you know, a perennial food plot is, is very ideal. Um, Ryan, every year. I'll ask you a question kind of along with that. So like in that image, she, you see right there with Andrew, if I was going to divide that up and put in a perennial food plot like clover plus a wildflower meadow, would it be better to do it in strips or in large patches? Would you think it'd be better that I have a patch of the of the wildflower or a strip of the wildflower? Yeah, or, or even like a moat, you know, like the, the border kind of thing. Um, so okay. were you asking me or Andrew? I, so I, uh, I'm sorry, I, think, I meant you, Ryan. I, I'm sorry, I meant you. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. Yeah, I probably a, a, a bigger patch maybe um would probably be a little bit easier and one of the reasons i kind of talked about a strip is because especially with clover i didn't really mention this um in my presentation but i really like to encourage landowners to have walking paths going through the meadow kind of helps them inspect it a little bit more but also helps them kind of enjoy it more from the interior um so i was kind of thinking you know maybe you could seed that with clover so then it kind of doubles as a path and a food plot but you know you're right. If it's if it's more linear like that, it, it probably would um, they'd probably go outside of it a little bit more. If it was a big block, they'd probably kind of stick there and get full and move on, maybe. But again, I can't. I'm not very good at predicting deer. I'm not even a very good hunter, so maybe I'm the wrong one to ask. Well, some of the things that I've heard with some of the meadow kinds of plantings is if you're having critters nesting in there, it might be, be more beneficial to have a large patch of it rather than a, a narrow strip of it. I would say. Yeah, definitely for the cover of the meadow, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I like the idea of putting the moat around the border of it, though, where you just have a, you know, like a cool season clover mix around the border and some trails through it. Okay, uh, another question, and speaking of uh, cover crops, Ryan, uh, the question is, are there any good cover crop species recommendations that you might have for meadow restoration. Do you have any experience with winter wheat? Um, I don't usually use winter wheat, but it, it will it will uh, be good. Um, uh, I usually use an annual rye. Uh, you know, anything that's going to be um, a cool season is is ideal. If you do a fall season or a fall seeding, um, and uh, and oats are usually what people use. I think in the spring, I almost always do fall. So um, yeah, annual rye, winter wheat. Um, you just want to make sure that it's not going to be an issue in the stand. Um, and so one thing that I didn't mention that's super important is you're going to want to seed it at a way lower rate than if you are seeding it, like what the bag recommends you seed for an agricultural stand. If you seed it as heavily as you would want to for a field, it's going to smother. It's Instead of kind of covering, it's going to smother. Um, so you want to go pretty light. I'd say 10% or less of what's recommended for uh, to seed a field. Um, but yeah, winter wheat will do it. Annual rye is great. Um, I even have, I like to use annual rye um, because I use it in my garden. If I have leftover seed, um, it kind of works out pretty nice. So that's, that's my top recommendation. And, and all of those are super available at any local, you know, seed and, uh, seed and feed mill. And I'll just mention that Andrew posted in the chat, the survey. So if you need a certificate of attendance, Make sure you click that survey and fill that out. It is four o'clock. And so folks are free to jump off if they need to. I think we'll we'll stay and answer a few more questions, Ryan and I will. Yeah, we, we've, got, we've got a couple more yet. Um, Dave asks, we treat poison ivy growing on trees in the winter by cutting to avoid contact with leaves. What chemical is best to treat as a basal or cut stem? Would you recommend triclopyr or glyphosate or a combination? Uh, triclopyr is probably going to be, if I was going to pick one active ingredient, I'd probably pick triclopyr for poison ivy control. And so, and that does give you the flexibility of treating it. 
if it's not growing on your on your prized tree with all the little rootlets there, then you can treat it as a basil bark. But typically, I would just cut a section out of a stem in that case, and I would just treat the the surface of that. Okay. And the next question is: Do you recommend arsenal for any cut surface or cut stump applications for invasive shrubs? So I do for professionals, but you have to be aware that arsenal, the active ingredient in products. But the Mazapir is the active ingredient in arsenal or um, there's some generics of it as well. But you really have to be cognizant of that product having a lot of soil activity. So it's okay for hack and squirt and stump treatments. But if you uh, put it out where other desirable plant roots can pick it up, you have to be really, really careful because it, it will affect your overstory trees. And so... If you're a good applicator and you're very aware, it's a very safe product. It has a really low toxicity rating, just carries a caution label. Uh, it's super effective on tree of heaven even for hack and squirt treatments. But just be aware that if you get it on the ground, it has a chance of being taken up by desirable plant roots. Okay, that is the last question I see in the in the Q&A, and we had a couple in the chat box. Okay, one more question about the continuing education link. I'll put that back in. And it's a link to provide you with a survey. So we'll send you a certificate of attendance, folks. Okay. So I believe that is everything we have. So with that, I want to thank everyone for for joining us for our, our webinar series uh, on behalf of everyone in the Woods in Your Backyard partnership, and particularly Dave and Ryan today. I want to thank them for, for joining us today. And a reminder, if you're looking to see this series again, you want to revisit the recordings, they'll be available on our University of Maryland Extension website. Go to the Woodland Stewardship Education page and look for the webinars and videos section and under the natural area management services section you'll find the uh, you'll find the recordings from the previous series and then this series will be available probably in mid april okay thanks everyone for joining us uh, thank you ryan thank you dave and uh like i said the recording should be available uh in a couple of weeks and uh, we'll let you know when it's there yeah. Thanks no. again.